thought we'd start with the question, which is, which year animal are you in Feng Shui? I'm a water dragon. A water dragon? Yeah. Okay. And where were you born? I was born in Malta. I think I probably grew up mostly in Cornwall. We, we lived in a place called Mullion in Cornwall, which is as far away as you can get without getting wet, in the extreme southwest between the Lizard and Land's End. So, I mean, my mother had five children under seven, so we were kind of wild. And then after that, I had a middle-class public school education, so was completely, you know, have no idea where I came from after that. Could you just expand on that a bit more for us? It was interesting. My father was a, um, a working-class lad from Manchester. My grandfather was a cotton mill worker in Salford, who never, in my father's words, earned more than a fiver a week in his life. When the war came, my father realised that the way to become middle-class was to volunteer for the forces, so he volunteered for the Navy, he had a fabulous mind and got very, very quick promotion. And when he joined the Navy, he thought, like that, hell, a lot of the arm from Jewish spirit, like that. My uncle Alan talked like that all his life, but my father developed RP. And he realised that what he needed, if his children would have the opportunities that the officers who fast-tracked ahead of him in the Navy got, that he needed for his sons, and this was a very sexist age. He, being the man that he was, he managed to get the Navy to pay for me to go to prep school. And then I got a scholarship to rugby, which is one of those schools, you know, rugby, Harrow, Eaton. But I was blessed with an e extraordinary education, which essentially I paid for myself. So I sound privileged, and that is kind of, that education is kind of a privilege. Educationally, I had some huge advantages, I, and I have, I have a really good memory. That's one of the gifts from my, from my father. I studied classical languages, so I was never, a, uh, I never took Latin very far, but I remember it all. Um, and also, my father being in the Navy when I was young, when I was very young, he would be away at sea, and he would come back to Cornwall for the weekend, and in the nicest possible way, he was keen to have my mother's attention. So I would end up going to church. My mother was Jewish Irish and not interested in religion, though she was, a, she was psychic and deeply spiritual. And my father was a rather aggressive atheist. But I ended up not only going to church services regularly, but also going to Sunday school regularly. I think probably two or three classes a week, but I didn't really remember. So I had the great good fortune to be very familiar with the Bible without being indoctrinated. Being at public school was, for me, a miserable time. I, I am not a joiner. And I discovered that I was working class. It hadn't occurred to me before. Salman Rushdie said he discovered that he was coloured when he was at rugby. I discovered I was working class. It was a very, very painful experience. When I left, I kind of reinvented myself. What did your parents do for a living um, during those uh, sort of formative years? My father was in the Navy. And then when he left the Navy, he joined the defence industry. Defence meaning offence. Ultimately, he was basically selling weapons. He was the marketing director of Marconi Space and Defence. He had been passed over in the Navy. He would not been promoted as he had hoped, having been the youngest lieutenant in the Navy. He didn't get promoted, and the reason he didn't get promoted was because he couldn't control his mouth. He had a one-liner for every occasion, and he obviously really upset somebody at some point. So he ended up being the marketing director of Marconi Space and Defence. He became very successful, earned a lot of money. I wouldn't say he made a lot of money, but he earned a lot of money. He was a very clever man, but it was a, he hated it. I remember him telling me, on the steps of the procurement department of the Ministry of Defence, I think in the Sudan, where he had just given a, a bung to the procurement guy, which is what you did, and then came out with these kids with flies on their eyes. And it broke his heart, literally broke his heart. Um, so he, he took early retirement. My mother, well, she was a very, very smart woman. My grandmother ran Virginia Woolf's office. So I come from a long line of, of feminists. She uh, worked with Mary Stopes. She worked with Methuen, worked with um, A.A. Milne, all sorts of very interesting people. My mother was born in New York, so she was an American citizen and was pretty much brought up in, in America. She was educated at Bryn Mawr. Her guardian during the war was Barbara, Barbara Tuckman, the historian. My mother was, as I say, Irish-Jewish. Um, she was sent away to school at the age of three. So she was kind of emotionally not expressive, but she was, she was very beautiful, an athlete, a mathematician, you know, a very, very smart woman. She became epileptic when she was in her late 20s and I watched her mind kind of dissolve. But she was, 
as I remember her when I was younger, this, this really does it to me. She was very beautiful, very bright, and very funny. Okay, thank you. So okay. what would be five short, three to four word bullet points of uh, your uh, working history? Three to four words. When I left school, I borrowed some money from my father and set up a chain of wrangler shops. Okay. And became a teen tycoon. Okay. And earned a great deal of money and spent rather more. We sold, we sold a business, a chain of eight record shops in 1975 and I moved on. I then went to study philosophy at Bedford College London. Uh, after a year I discovered that it was not dealing with any of the questions I was interested in. Right. Logical positivism defines any important question as meaningless. <laughs> so I, 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 I moved on. But when I joined the financial services business and for five or six years I was a very motivated yuppie a very aggressive salesman of financial products. I broke, broke sales records, but I kind of disappeared as a human being. And if I carried along that path, I would be physically dead, let alone morally dead. At that time, I got married. I had three sons, who are, of whom I'm very proud. In 1981, I did a thing called the Exegesis Seminar, which was instant enlightenment, just give us a weekend. And for me, it did exactly what was on the, t on the can. I remembered who I was. When I was a little boy, you know, I was weird very, very young. And um, I remembered, remembered who I was. I carried on in financial services for another, whatever that was, nearly 20 years more because I had, I had children, I had, you know, I had mouths to feed. But at that point, I was explicitly on the path. So I spent a lot of time reading everything I could read about awakening and studied with a lot of masters. So I studied with people like Robert Daubeny, which is a mixed blessing, Ron Smotherman, Lillian Two, a little bit with Joey Yap. For some while, I did a little bit of Dianetic Clearing. I have examined, studied, or been engrossed in pretty much everything that I could find prior to going Chinese. What was the germinating moment for you? Well, in the, the time of Desert Storm, which I think was 1992, I was working on, uh, as an assistant with Dr. Chuck Spezzano, whose uh, model, the psychology of vision, informs still to this day everything that I do. And we were working on biblical archetypes. Now, if you, I told you, I know my Bible really well. <laughs> if you know your Bible, you know the story of Abraham and Isaac and Esau. And the story is about Abraham. He, his wife, Sarah, is past menopause. They have no heir. God says, says to Sarah, don't worry, you will have a child. And she says, you must be joking. And, you know, and God said, this is the big G talking, but she still pays no attention. She tells Abraham to take a, a concubine who bears him a child. She calls Sarah, if I remember rightly. She bears him a child called Ishmael, who is the father of the Arab races. So this is 1992, Desert Storm. We were looking at this, how Israel had thrown a hand grenade into the Middle East and how everything was different. And how could we deal with it? So there was this question of who was entitled to what? Because then Sarah does concede that she has Isaac, who is, who is the line that comes all the way down to Jesus, you know, through, through Jacob and Joseph and David and so on and so forth. The idea was if we dealt with the archetypes, then we would deal with the real issues on some, on some level. And World War III didn't break out, so you have me to thank for that. However, in that process, as the early 1990s, I noticed parallels between the years and the years just before the Second World War. And 1992 looked very like 1932 with the rise of Balkan dictators and the, the things that were happening on the streets. And, and uh, I got talking with someone who said, do you not realize that the Chinese consider time to work in 60 year cycles? And it blew my mind. So I went and studied it. And what I got was having seen people like Chuck Spezzano do extraordinary work, healing just by going into someone's reality and pulling it out. You know, Michael Breen, I've seen do that. Michael Neal, some amazing people. Just do this remarkable stuff. Take out someone's reality, brush it up, put it back in. Reinventing the wheel, each creating their own model. I saw that there was a healing model that had been in operation for at least 4,000 years. And there were 4,000 years of diagnostics. And there was an awful lot of literature. And I could use that as the track to run on to be the healer that I had always been. If someone's looking for a number, you've been studying Feng Shui since 92, so about 24 years. Yes. And um, approximately how many Western practitioners are there at your level? 
I don't know what the number is, but it's less than 50. Yeah. And in the UK? I meant in the UK. Oh, you meant in the UK, yeah. Yeah. In, yeah. in the world, I guess there, there are probably a similar number, not many more in the US. And there are, in Germany, there are some, France, there are some, Poland, there are some, Greece, there are some. I mean, there are some around the world, but you're talking about ones away from the Orient. Yes. And Classically the trained, level. working professionally. Yeah. Relatively small numbers. When we put on the Turin Congress in 2008, we got about 300 people. So that's probably Europe or close to it. They have a huge CV with Fong Shui alone, let alone everything else. Could you just give us um, just three or four uh, succinct CV elements that will give us a picture of your particular practice and experience with Fong Shui? From 1992, I started studying. Um, I read everything that I could find about feng shui and did my best to decide what was real feng shui, what was kind of a new age equivalent, what was total nonsense, what had imported symbolism and intention and psychology, which I will not dismiss by the way, and what was pure classical feng shui. Having done that, I was very fortunate that I bumped into a guy called Tony Holdsworth, who I had known from financial services, a brilliant, brilliant salesman. Um, who was, uh, had just discovered Master Chan Kun Hua, who after 20 odd years of study had become a master. He's a Hong Kong, he was from Hong Kong though, he he's actually lives in Edinburgh. I mean, he, he had a, a slightly unorthodox version of classical feng shui called Chui style. I studied with him full time for four years, which was a completely life changing thing. It was a very, very, very different from what I, I'd expected. Having done a lot of new age work, I was expecting to be able to go, you know, sit like this, whatever you do with your fingers, and go, um, and I would learn it. But no, it was more demanding than anything that I had done since university. I did a weekend with Lillian too to find out what she was up to, which is very, very interesting and helpful. I then studied with Peter Leung, who is a Hong Kong master. I studied with Master Mas Kahatung, who is a Thai Chinese, who studied what's called Shuang Gong Da Gua. Um, these, peop these people are geniuses. And also, I studied Barzi with Derek Walters. My particular fascination is Barzi, four pillars, that is what is sometimes misleadingly called the Chinese horoscope, a map of our most likely mistakes, which is what I use to know people in some detail sometimes before I've met them. So th those are probably the key things.